Uh, so this was an article by Ayan Hirsi Ali. Anyone hear of her? Ayan Hirsi Ali? Oh, good. See, people are reading. Ayan Hirsi Ali is, uh, uh, is of uh, Somali stock. And uh, she is notorious for presenting her body to, who is that very famous uh, Dutch artist? Uh, she gave her naked body to him. So listen to this, I mean, you know, hold, hold on to your chairs. Uh, so that he could write the verses of the Quran that they found objectionable. Verses of the Quran, they found objectionable <coughs> on her body. So now you know who Ayan Hirsi Ali is. So she writes, okay, two more things about Ayan Hirsi Ali. Ayan Hirsi Ali is married to a guy known as uh, he's one of the most powerful most influential political philosophers and writers in the modern world. And uh, he is currently at, the, at, in, at Stanford, at the Hoover Institution. And uh, so she's married to him. He had to divorce his wife in order to marry her. Uh, so she writes this article. And the title of the article is <coughs> The New War on Islamism. So those of you who have come early, you can pick up a copy. I'm not going to tell the others who come late what the copy is all about because I don't have enough copies. So that's your reward for coming on time. Uh, so she, uh, she writes this article. And uh, the thing I want you to focus on when you do read the article is that she is actually using Sirah. So she looks at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the Meccan perspective and the Medinan perspective. And so generally Western scholars when they talk about Rasulullah, they speak positively about him from a Western perspective, from a Meccan perspective, not from a Medinan perspective. So which brought me to uh, a new realization that we have to actually prepare people to address the challenges brought up, f fought by people like Ayan Hirsi Ali. It's one thing for you to know something about the life of the Prophet Wasallam, and for that you certainly need to read something. Read a good book, one book only. Pick a book and read it. But after that you should become ambassadors for the Prophet Wasallam, And in order to do that you have to understand how people look at Rasulullah. So she is, she is, uh, an, uh, she is uh, I think she's an atheist. Obviously grew up in a Muslim household and uh, then became an atheist. And now you have, you have uh, atheists who are, who are actually compassionate and look at Islam in a positive light. And they're athe atheists who are implacably opposed to everything that is Islamic. She's one of those people. And uh, She's obviously, uh, when you want the guy's name, you want his name, you can't get his name. Anyway, he'll come to me. Maybe it's Allah's way of cleansing my mind of his name. So what I thought I would do for today at least is allow you to understand that Rasulullah is one of the most important catalysts for Westerners to understand Islam. And so you have, once you understand that, the next is for you to understand that even when Muslims look at Rasulullah, they're not looking at him from the pa same perspective. No two writers look at Rasulullah from the same perspective. So, that, so the task we set ourselves today is to take you through a journey in which you will not see the seerah, but you will be able to understand how other people see the seerah. You get it? So you're going to be looking at their perspective on the seerah. So we'll start with, we'll start with, uh, let's see what happened. You heard about uh, the, the Hebdo cartoons, right? 
the Hebrew cartoons st were, were, were uh, printed and published in, in France. Remember that. And that's, this takes place in the early 2200s, 2000s, I think. And it would seem that this is a new phenomenon. Actually, one of the first persons who, who used caricature to demean Rasulullah was the father of modern Western thought. This whole idea that we have today about individual liberty and freedom and so on. The father of that, of that idea was a guy called Voltaire. Heard of him? Voltaire wrote a book, wrote a, he didn't write the book, but wrote, Voltaire wrote a play. And that play, every, if, you, if I take away the names from that, from that article and take away the dating, you would think that this article is about what happened 20 years ago. The very same response, the very same on both sides. So the Turkish ambassador, uh, he uh, 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 objects to this particular uh, play in which Rasulullah is cast in the worst light possible. Worst light possible. And this is Voltaire. Now, in fairness to Voltaire, Voltaire was an equal opportunity critic. So he did much the same thing with Catholicism. He didn't like religion. But obviously, the Prophet Sallallahu is an easy prey because it's easy to attack. There's no one around to, to defend him. And he, this, he was part of a Christian milieu, so that just gave him extra power, see? So Voltaire was one of the first people to do that. I want to run, run through this quickly because we have to get, get through down to the bottom. Uh, the other person who did that was a person called Patricia Crone. But Crone was not mocking Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you know, you, you, on the one hand, you have this idea of Rasulullah and so on. So here you have Voltaire turning him, demonizing him, some kind of shaitan. And then you have Crone saying he actually didn't exist. What Crone did, and Crone was, by the way, these are very powerful people. That's why I want you to pay attention to them. Crone just died in 2017. She was also at Stanford. She held a very high position at, at, at Stanford. So these are people in very high positions. Crone just, one of the problems that Western scholars have is what I told you about. I told you that that yet, let's just say this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And then you see him through these, these, these are your sources. We said the Quran was the source, Hadith was the source, and uh, the books of Sirah were the three major sources, right? And then from that, you have all these things, they go through lenses. So this is the lens on the top. Let's call this the lens on the top the lens of people who either say that he is morally and ethically not at all like Muslims believe him to be. Or who say that he actually didn't exist. He didn't exist. The Quran came about 200 years after Muslims believe it had. And uh, the uh, Mecca itself was not Mecca, it was Jerusalem. This is a whole different way of looking at it. And even, even Western scholars eventually agreed that, that so much of what she writes, there's another person who writes with her called Cook, uh, is, is based on very, very faulty evidence and uh, a great deal of speculation. So I gave you two examples. There are many, many examples of people who fall in this category, the top category. The top people who uh, either have an axe to grind 
or simply want to make a mark in their academic professions by taking on, because in, in, in academia, uh, the more dramatic, the more outlandish your theory is, the greater the likelihood that people, that it would be published and given recognition. You have to know that too. That when people write, they're not just writing because they want to uh, pursue the truth. Sometimes they're looking for a job, they're getting tenured. Sometimes they simply want a bump in their salary or they want that position of chair. That's, that's the politics of academia. You have to know that. So this is about outsiders. Insiders also have their own perspectives. So two of the most popular books in Islam today about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is by one person called Ar-Rahiq al Maktum, right, by Mubarak Puri. And the other one is by Lings. Have you heard about these books? Martin Lings and, and uh, uh, Safi Ar-Rahman Mubarak Puri. Safi Ar-Rahman Mubarak Puri is a Salafi. So, it, it, so you have to know that. And the, the key defining feature of Salafi Islam is the authenticity, the quest for authenticity. The quest for authenticity. Somebody tells you he's a Salafi, it means that he belongs to a group that is primarily defined by this quest for authenticity. Is it Sahih? Is it authentic? Does it have provenance? You understand? These are the fact. These are the the, the, the the things that people look at. Martin Lings is not so much that. Martin Lings is a Sufi. So therefore, their books would be slightly different. Both these books are, by the way, the most popular books ever written in English on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and there's nothing objectionable in it. Mubarak Puri would have a problem with links because links uses all three of these sources. And sometimes, if I, I don't know if I said this in this particular class or in some other class, sometimes you have a framework and you need to complete that framework. And to complete that framework, you require a particular missing piece. And that piece might not be the best piece available, but it is the only piece available. You get it? So if it is the only piece available, you're gonna use it. From an engineering, say, you know, forget about the theory of engineering, the practicals of engineering. So you got this idea of, I wanna build this thing. And then when you get to actually building it, everything fits except two pieces. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna try and find something and retrofit it so that it kind of works. So that's what Lynx does. Mubarak Puri tries to avoid that because he's driven by this idea that whatever I write must be authentic. But the, the important thing to rem remember, both these books are backward looking. They're looking to determine what actually happened in Makkah, what actually happened in Medina, what really happened. And the reason I told you about this, uh, this quest for authenticity, and this is what also uh, 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 prompted this particular pre presentation, is that uh, two weeks ago, I don't see them here today, we had uh, brothers who said, who had, uh, they, 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 came, they asked if the, the second surah to be revealed was noon, or was, whether it was, Ya uh, Ayyuhal if you remember that discussion we had. Uh, so you would find that book A would tell you it's Mudathir and book B would tell you it's Noon. So the reason you'd find this divergence or variation in text is because people have a particular idea of what they want to portray the, through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The important thing about this is, to the best of my knowledge, both Mubarak Puri and Lings are not too concerned about, they don't have a framework and they want to push Rasulullah through that. They simply want to look at the most authentic or the most, uh, the most complete
picture of the Prophet Okay? Next category, where people have a particular agenda. They have a particular agenda. And they look at the Prophet وسلم, with that agenda. I'm going to take one non-Muslim and one Muslim. The non-Muslim is a person called Maxim Rodinson. And the, and the, and the, the other, and the Muslim is a person called Tariq Ramadan. R Rodinson's book is one of the most sympathetic books on the life of the Prophet Very sympathetic. A Muslim would be very happy to read it. That's the kind of writing he did. Very sympathetic. But, Ma Re but Rodinson was a Marxist. So when he looked at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now that I told you that he's a Marxist, what do you think he would tell you was the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Anyone? What was the, if, if, you, ha you haven't even, you haven't heard the word, the name Rodinson until today perhaps, right? So let alone read his book. But I'm telling you he's a Marxist, so now you can fill in that blank. What do you think Rodinson, when Rodinson looked at Rasulullah, what did he see? A social reformer. A social reformer. Now you understand why it's important to know the author and not just read the book. Because once you know the author, then you understand what you're going to get, in from, get from the book. That's very important. If you know who the author is, what his orientation is, how he thinks, who he is affiliated with, then you'd know what the book is about. You might not know the details of the book. This works very well for somebody who knows Sira. If you know Sira and you want to keep reading, you could do that, but if you read it with this particular perspective, it says, okay, who is this guy? And what, what is his perspective? What is he trying to show? Then you will see, Rodinson is a great example of that. Very sympathetic, but ultimately for him, Rasulullah, he's not saying Rasulullah was not the messenger of God with a spiritual dimension. He's not saying that. But he's saying his primary mission, if you look at it on the face of this earth, was to enhance human life, to create greater equality, and so on. Okay? Tariq Ramadan is a Muslim who lives in the same world that Rodinson lived in. And both found that world very hostile to Prophet, the Prophet Sallallahu Rodinson was coming from an atheistic Marxist perspective, and Ramadan, the, great, the grandson of Hassan al-Banna, had a very different uh, uh, take. But he too was trying to do something that you won't find in other books, which was to give the, an account, he's written a book on the life of the Prophet, give an account of the Prophet Sallallahu as being a caring, loving, compassionate human being. Everything that Voltaire was, was, was showing the opposite of. You see? So you, you can understand that. And, and Tariq Ramadan is a builder. He's not just a historian. He has a vision of where Islam must be in the year 2050. So when he talks to you about Rasulullah, he is asking you to look at that. See, this is what you learn from Rasulullah, and this is how you can make progress. This is what you learn from Rasulullah, and this is how you make progress. So this is another example of how people either look backwards or they look forward. Here, even with Rodinson, although Rodinson was not Muslim, if Rodinson is telling you Rasulullah was a social reformer, then you as individual Muslim, what is your primary objective in Islam? To be social reformers. Your primary objective would be to be social reformers. That's why you'd find a person like Rodinson becomes very popular 
This is all connected. He becomes very popular in places like Egypt. Because Egypt's intell intellectuals, the intelligentsia, they, were, they leaned more towards French than they did towards English. They graduated from the Sorbonne, they, they interacted with France, and now suddenly somebody gives them the, um, an image, see this? They give him an image of the prophet that is contemporaneous and that is applicable in the modern world. This is not some seventh century figure walking around with a thobe and dealing with issues like goats and chicken and so on. No, no, no. This was a social reformer with a very defined agenda. Now suddenly Muhammad becomes alive again in the hearts and minds, not of the, of, of the, of the Rifis, of the people who live in the villages, no, no. They, their understanding of Rasulullah is still defined by the shuyukh and the ulama and the Sufis. These are the guys who went to college, they became doctors, they became engineers and so on. They split into two groups. There were those who joined the Ikhwan and those who were secular and Muslim. They were not secular and kafir, but secular and Muslim. But they didn't quite know what to do with Islam. And notice that this period was when Egypt was going, undergoing its socialist re revolution. So the whole thing just comes together again. See? So it's very important that you also look at the lenses through which even, even these sources are examined. They're not moving. Here, she moves away from the sources. But everyone else stays with the sources. And they just spin it. They take one part of the source and highlight it, and another part of the source, and they don't highlight it. So you would find, for example, with Ling's, although his book is very balanced, I, I, I really like his book, and of course he's English. He used to be a curator in the, in the British Museum, and he's a deep and profound Sufi. So now that I've told you that, if you go back and read Ling's, then you say, ah, I can smell it. That spirituality, that focus on the individual, that focus on enriching yourself. One more person I want to add here to this group is a person called Haikal, or Haikal. Hussein Haikal well, was a very prominent Egyptian. And he wrote a book on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which Ismail Faruqi translated into English. Remember the late Islam, Ismail Faruqi? Ismail Faruqi was a very prominent Islamic scholar who was killed, he was at Temple University, and I think he was killed in 1989 or 1990 or somewhere around there. Very, very popular, uh, profound thinker. So he translated that book. And that was a book that appealed to, it was about Rasulullah, but it was very rationalistic. So if the approach is rationalistic, what would you not, what would not feature in a book whose approach is rationalistic? Miracles. So the, the Mi'raj will be an experience that he had personally while lying in his bed. His soul went on a journey, his body did not go. So when someone says that, you have to look at the person and say, why are you saying that? He says, because he, re he represents a particular sector of society, a se sector that went to college, that did engineering or medicine, and that, that, that just has great difficulty in dealing with these miraculous events. So you can go through 300 pages of his book and not find too much reference to works on miracles. Okay? And uh, then we have the books of, right down at the bottom here, of people who who might not 
they might not uh, write a book. They uh, present the sira in the form of lectures. So I'll give you two examples. There is a person called Israr Ahmed. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him, Dr. Israr Ahmed, who was, uh, who was a guest at this masjid on more than one occasion. And I had the pleasure of meeting and spending time with him. So if you look at the way in which he understands Sirah, then you would see clearly that this might be Sirah or it might not be Sirah, but this can only come from a person like Israr Ahmed. He is someone who believes in an Islamic revolution. And so everything, when he looks at Rasulullah, that's all he sees. Where, where Rodinson, Maxime Rodinson, saw Rasulullah as a kind of pseudo-Marxist revolutionary, Isra'ar Ahmad saw him as the Amir of the movement of Iqamat al-Din, the establishment of Islam. And then he would, if, if you listen to his works, then you can see clearly he, t he systematically lays that, that whole system out, that whole prog program. You have to ask yourself this question, why does Israr Ahmad see that? And a great scholar, also from the same part of the world, whose name was uh, Shibli Normani, Shibli Normani, he doesn't see it. Both looking at the same person, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They both you all using the same sources, but they do, they ending up at different conclusions. The reason you end up in these different conclusions, whether it is the conclusion of Voltaire, Crone, uh, who's this? Maxime Rodinson, uh, all of these people, is because you come to Rasulullah with a particular perspective, a particular mission a particular agenda, and then you see that mission in his life. You get, you get it now? That is different from, from these two sources. Uh, Mubarak Puri and, where was that one? And links. Ask, you, so in conclusion, we can open up for question and answers. In conclusion, ask yourself these questions. Is this person looking at Rasulullah uh, through a backward perspective or a forward perspective? In other words, does he simply want to authenticate? I want to present to the audience, to the readership, I want to present a complete picture or a very authentic picture. That shows you he doesn't have much of, a, of an agenda. He doesn't have an agenda. He's simply seeking the best sources. Or if he is forward-looking, there's so many of them. If you take Karen Armstrong, she's written The Life of the Prophet. Uh, what's his name? This Chopra. What's his name? Deepak Chopra. They're writing in the same way, sympathetically, about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a decent, kind, compassionate reformer. So they're trying to, they're not really forward-looking, but what they are trying to do is to uh, rearrange American society's attitude towards the Prophet Sallallahu So these are three categories, people who look backwards, and when they do, they simply authenticate. When people look forward, they're either doing that in order to to invigorate the community, encourage the community, show them that this is a path, that if you want to in, you, transform Pakistani society, or you want to transform Egyptian society, and this is how Rasulullah did it. See that? Or they're simply rearranging material because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been so badly maligned by people like Ayan Hirsi Ali, they want to show that, well, no, this is not the true picture of Rasulullah. He was actually a more balanced human being. Okay.
Questions? No questions. Alhamdulillah. Are they in the perspective? Oh yeah, but it's it's. But which one is dominant? I don't know that. I don't know which one is dominant. And I don't want to share my own perspective with you. Yeah, but but. That's right. Which does not necessarily mean that they are wrong. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. Oh, clearly some of them were. She admitted before she died, she died in 2017, Patricia Crohn admitted that, you know, uh, we got some things wrong. Hey, but I got my job and I got tenure and I got professorship, all the rest of it. But we got things wrong. It was way, way out. But generally, you cannot say two or three things about most of these people, that they have bad intentions. Voltaire had a bad intention, no doubt about that. That, they, they, that they, their, their perspective is entirely wrong. You cannot say that. The, those two things at least you cannot say about them. The interesting thing about Voltaire and why I want you to remember that, very important for you living in the West to remember that. Every time somebody attacks Rasulullah, understand it goes back all the way to the 1700s. It's not new. What has happened is the, that the objective has changed. The mission has changed. <coughs> Excuse me. Voltaire was probably the father of, of, of the, the, the Hebdo group. And I'll tell you how. But for the most part, there are many who wrote after Voltaire, and they, they, they were driven by their own Christian agenda to demean Rasulullah. The thing about Islam, you have to understand, let me just share this with you. <coughs> Islam is a very difficult religion to criticize from a, from a religious perspective, very difficult. So what you have to do is find the Achilles heel of Islam. And the Achilles heel of Islam is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The most difficult thing to, to <laughs> the most difficult thing to, to criticize about Islam is the central pillar of Islam, which is Tawheed. Very difficult to criticize that. And that's why when you're looking at look now that I told you this, look at criticisms against Islam then you would find that the criticisms are not at Tawheed. It's hard to attack Tawheed. Because all other versions of Tawheed are approximations. Christianity has Tawheed, but is diluted with the Trinity. Judaism has Tawheed, but it is compromised with the, with, with the, with the idea of the chosen people. Islam is a universal Tawheed. So it's hard to attack. But Rasulullah is an easy target. And so when, when people from the 17th century on would attack Rasulullah, not Voltaire, others did in order to undermine Islam, because at, in the 1700s, even at, you know, there's a great professor, his name is Marshall Hodgson. If you ever have this, the, the, the energy to read his book, it's one of the most astounding books on Islamic history. Very difficult book to read, three volumes. He couldn't finish it. One of his acolytes completed the book. It's called The Venture of Islam. So he says, you know, if, if a Martian had to come down into, onto the face of, and you people was, every time I share the story with, with my students, they become so despondent. <coughs> he says, when, if a Martian had to descend on the face of this earth in the 16th century, he would be convinced that the future of humanity lies with Islam in the 16th century because of the power that Islam had at that time. Because and not just religious power, intellectual, cultural, aesthetic, 
arts, literature, music, in every area, the dominant civilization was Islamic. So at that point in time, you, if you're a Christian, you don't have much to attack Islam with. And that's why you find so many books emerging about the Prophet ﷺ from that point onwards. Voltaire is different because he doesn't attack Islam per se. He has a problem with religion at large. And Islam comes within that. But that, that tradition of attacking Islam from a secular perspective, a liberal perspective, is what this, book, what this article is about. That Islam is against human values, that Islam demeans women, that Islam is intolerant to minorities. There are, we have some really good answers to this, but we have to take time out to understand and learn about this. There isn't a single text on the face of this earth that deals with inter-religious affairs like Islam. No text. There isn't one. And Islam, I just read the verse to you this afternoon. That verse should be celebrated. No religion on the face of this earth has a verse that is equal to that. All people of the book, come, let's work together. What do you call an interfaith relationship? It's seven centuries, 1400 years ago. So to tell us today, in the 21st century, that Muslims are intolerant because Islam is their religion, that, that's basically what it is. There was a time when people said that the problem is not Mus Islam, the problem is Muslims, because they're bad followers. It's no longer that. Now it's switched, particularly in Europe. In Europe, the problem is not Muslims, the problem is Islam. It's a bad religion that they follow. And here's the list of reasons why Muslims are, are, are failing. Because Islam teaches them these things. I finished here today, went, went to, to, to the apartment and looked at, at uh, the material that came to me on my, in my in inbox. There's just an art article about what happened in France. Uh, the, the, the Supreme Court of France just uh, upheld the banning of the Burkini uh, in France. So if you want to cover yourself as a Muslim in, in, in France, you can't do that on the beach. If you have a private swimming pool, by all means. But any public uh, area, any public arena will not allow you as a Muslim to come to the beach or the swimming pool dressed as covered. So these are the challenges we face, and you know, it's, it's, I think it would be, uh, I would be remiss if I did not share these things with you, and uh, hopefully uh, we can work on, uh, on providing some, some of these. Obviously we don't have answers to everything, nor do we have the energy or the time, but uh, if we want to, there are certainly ways in which we can address some of these issues. Anyone else? Oh yeah, that's why I told you, you need a book like that. You need to read one book that gives you an authentic understanding of the Prophet Sallallahu But when you're done with that, and you want to read other books, understand that every other book that you read will be following a particular pattern. It would most definitely be following a particular pattern. So I haven't, uh, I, it, it's, it's my own uh, lack of knowledge. I don't know of any, and I'm sure there are, I don't know of any good book written by a Shi'i on, 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 on the life of the Prophet. But let's just assume we know of one. 
what do you think that book will be focusing on? You understand? You, can, you know exactly what the book, that book will be looking at putting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and directly connecting Ali to him and, and, and establishing succession. You see it? And I can assure you, I've, I've been looking at this myself. It's not hard to do. There are so many instances in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where one can easily make the argument that Rasulullah himself was inclined towards making Ali his successor. And this is me just looking at it, you know, from the outside. If you spend a great deal of time looking at these texts, you're going to find that. So from a Shi'i perspective, this is what you would find. But you, so for people who have never embarked on this journey of trying to understand who Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, the, your best would be to, f to, f to follow the, the original authentic sources. Uh, but understand that every other book that you'll find, apart from these two, there are probably a few others, uh, they don't necessarily follow authenticity. They follow a particular perspective, a particular agenda, and they see things through that particular perspective. Whether it is, and I, and, I've, and I have to bring in the non-Muslims who are sympathetic because I've gone to so many homes where I've found books. This is a very interesting point. I found books by non-Muslim authors and not a single book by a Muslim author on the life of the Prophet. And these are, you know, practicing Muslims and so on. And then I, you know, 10, 15, 20 homes and then you see a pattern emerging. They want endorsement. These are Muslims, they want endorsement uh, that Rasulullah was in fact who he is. And so if Karen Armstrong gives it to them, good. If Chopra gives it to them, you understand? So when you do see one, don't scoff at it, just... Oh, the other thing is, don't, don't make comments about these things. This is only for your own understanding, and you know, if you don't want to get into f uh, an argument with people. So if you find a Chopra on somebody's bookshelf, understand, okay, it's a good book. Or a Karan Armstrong, good book. But the fact that a Muslim is, unless he's, he's, he's into books and you find a whole bunch of books on Rasulullah, that's different. But if that's the one book out there, more than likely this particular person has heard so much about Rasulullah. And you know, these imams, they just keep rattling off and rattling off and God knows what is true and what is not true. Let's get, a, let's get someone from the outside. So Armstrong is someone from the outside. She gives you endorsement from the outside. It's just a phenomenon you're going to find in America. Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, certainly by Christians mainly. Obviously, you understand we are at a huge disadvantage. This is something you have to understand about ourselves, our, our, our Islam. We are at a huge disadvantage in terms of religious polemics. Right? I mean, in there are one or two ways in which we regard Isa alayhi salam as superior to Rasulullah. That's our iman. And generally, we have, we have to believe in all the Anbiya as we believe in Rasulullah. So it, there's no attacking somebody else's Nabi for us. More important than that is, there's no attacking somebody else's religion for us. It is, it is categorically pro prohibited. وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Do not past slur or say bad things about people who worship beings other than Allah. You can criticize. You can comment. You can't mock. You can't disparage. That gives you a certain dignity. A Muslim is, is one who has karama. He has dignity. He has dignity in the way he engages a non-Muslim. And so when a non-Muslim engages the, and says these things about Rasulullah, you have to be quiet. You have to be quiet. I am not in favor of these demonstrations where we're burning things down and burning houses down and burning cars down and burning ourselves down in the process. 
That's not karama. You want to go out there and protest, take a placard, by all means. But dignity is what defines a Muslim. Whether he is promoting Islam or defending Islam. And if somebody is, is, is the Quran is very categor categorical about that. If somebody is saying things that are demeaning to the Prophet or to the Quran or to Allah, you walk away. Hatta That's right. Until they start talking about something else. Doesn't tell you to get there and start fighting with them. So your hands are tied. You don't have these options. Your hands are tied. You can't engage in, 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 in the kind of, of mockery that Voltaire engaged in. And when Voltaire engages in that, you, there's a certain etiquette that you have to follow. Because that's how a Muslim behaves. So, you know, these are some of the constraints that Islam places upon us. But it does not ask us to, to be quiet. It certainly allows us and also requires of us that we respond. But we do so in a very measured tone, do it by great deliberation. And if you don't have to have the answer today, Allah will give you the answer tomorrow or the day after. You will have the answer. Maybe not today. I've had so many experiences of this, where somebody tells me something and I just don't have an answer. And then I'm sitting in the plane and flying and the answer comes to me. I said, oh my God, why now? Why not at that time? But then you take that, you keep it in your pocket, and inshallah, next time around, you have an answer. Anyone else? There's no avoiding that. That's a very good question, by the way. How do you approach Islam without an agenda? How do you engage books or engage people or engage groups that are not agenda-driven? If you're living in Egypt, for instance, and, 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 and Ikhwani Islam is, is very influential, if you look at their texts and so on, it's very clear that, that this is Islam being looked at from a particular perspective. That perspective might not be entirely wrong, nor might it be entirely right. Jamaat Islami, for instance, in Pakistan. Mo Maulana Maududi, I think he wrote a book called Tarikh Makkah. I'm not sure, but I think he did. So when he writes about Tarikh Makkah, you can well imagine that that's his perspective. That's not Shibli Nomani's perspective. My, my, my task today with you was simply to apprise you to this that you, there are these authentic sources and people just go to them and they take from that, but then they are, there's a, there, the vast majority of books are written from different perspectives. And so you might, I'm not saying telling you not to read it, but I, I want you to read it with your eyes open. And I say open, I mean with this perspective in mind. You say, okay, I'm reading this, let's see how we handle it. And you, you'd be surprised how much you learn. If you know that this particular person has, has a, a revolutionary perspective and you read there, you can pick it up yourself. Then you become an, you're becoming a very intelligent, uh, uh, <coughs> critical reader. And that's what you need. You have to become an, a critical reader. You read the hadith of Sirah, because if you read the second book of Sirah, 90% of the stuff you know already. And when he starts going left or going right, then he says, ah, why is he doing that? Why is he picking this particular surah and not that one? Amazing stuff. I mean, if you, I, 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 did, I told you that there's not much about, that I know about Shiite writings on, on, on Islam. Uh, you know, let me give you a classic example of how Sunnis and Shias differ. I remember about before the Hijrah, 
there were two, the two most important people in the lives of the Prophet, Prophet ﷺ were involved in that. One slept on his bed and one went to the cave. Right? The one who slept on his bed was Ali radiallahu anhu and the one who went to the cave is now this is the other disadvantage of Sunni Islam. Sunni Islam is called Sunni because it simply says take the authentic and just play, put it out there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it favors A or favors B. All the other uh, uh, versions of Islam, they don't do that. Shia is clearly is, is, is tilted towards the, the Ahlul Bayt. Sunni Islam is not tilted towards or, towards or against the Ahlul Bayt. It just tells you, here's the material, this is the most authentic material, now you can do with it what you want to. That's Sunni Islam. So when they look at this, what the Shiite writings generally do, is they put a question mark on the person who was إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ مَنْ هُوَ فِي الْغَارِ For us it is Abu Bakr. So what do you think they're doing with all the Sira material on, 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 on the question of who was in the cave. They question it. They question it. So if you look at a Shia book on the, on the story of the cave, they're not going to conclude that it is Abu Bakr. And those who accept it was Abu, Abu Bakr, they, it's a very interesting how your, your religious polemics comes into it. I want you to go back and look at that verse. Now that I told you this, go back and look at the verse. There, Rasulullah says, La tahzan. Y you remember that verse, right? He says, because he had weak iman. Because of his weak iman, that's why he, Rasulullah had to console him. So he here's a classic example of the material being the same. But the agenda that you, through which you, you are running that material slightly shifts the material itself. You see that? I hope the, the, this, this last example will make it very clear for you. Exactly the same material, same story. The, 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 uh, the bed one, no, no problem there because Sunnis and Shias both accept that Ali radiallahu anhu was in the bed. The cave, there are two issues there. One is that was not Abu Bakr, somebody else. It doesn't matter who it was, but it was not Abu Bakr. And the second one was, it was Abu Bakr, but part of his hypocrisy was that he had weak iman. So I, here's a very good example to conclude with where all the material is accepted, it's all taken from the authentic sources, but the spin you put on it is different. <laughs>